Hey everybody, in today's video, we're gonna discuss Spinorama data, how you get it, what it's used for. Before we go any further, if you haven't seen either of my previous two videos, which discuss on axis and off axis response, I highly recommend that you go check those out because what we're gonna be talking about today has everything to do with those two videos. Spinorama data is called Spinorama data because you are measuring the speaker on and off axis, both around the speaker horizontally and above and below the speaker vertically. Having all these angles of measurements allows you to group them in a way that will produce a few graphics. And that set of graphics is called Spinorama. That Spinorama data is also defined in the CTA 2034 standard, which I discussed in part one of this series. And if you wanna go back and check that out, you're certainly more than welcome to. The CTA standard provides us with this graphic that is used to kind of just give you an idea of what Spinorama means. And like I said, it's 360 degrees above and below the speaker and around to the side. The Spinorama data looks like what we're seeing here. And again, this is also referenced in the 2034 specification. Now, when I provide the data, I'm providing it via a script that Clipple uses to produce the graphics. And the colors are, it's, well, it's not black and white, it's actually in color. To help explain what this actually is and what all these different lines on this graphic means, I'm gonna provide you with a real example based off some testing that I've done on the Kali IN5. And it's the same one that I use in the example for my previous two videos in this series. This is the standard output per the Clipple. And just FYI, if you don't know what I mean when I say the Clipple, the Clipple is an automated machine that will allow you to measure a speaker um, completely anechoically in a non-anechoic environment. So for example, I'm gonna throw up a video of me measuring a speaker in my room here, and this is actually my garage. The Clipple device, which is the near fill scanner, will rotate around the speaker measuring any number of points, and then take those number of points and build the sound profile based on a bunch of complicated math that's above my head. Once the near fill scanner is complete doing its runs, it will provide you with a lot of data and that data can be output into this CEA 2034 standard format. And that's what we see here. And like the previous graphic that we just looked at, this has a bunch of different lines on it. So I'm gonna step through what each one of these lines means. The first line that you need to pay attention to is the on axis response that is shown here in black. This is what I talked about in part one of this series, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I will just simply show you this graphic that is provided in Dr. Tool's book, and it shows you an example, you know, kind of an illustration of what this line represents. And when it says direct sound, the on axis sound, it is coming directly from the speakers to the listening position. It's the sound isn't going anywhere else. It's just coming right to the listener. The second line in the spinorama is known as the listening window, and that is in green here. And what you can see here is it is a combination of the on axis sound and the plus minus 30 degree horizontal window. So going off axis to the side, as well as the plus minus 10 degree window. So going 10 degrees above or below the reference plane of the speaker. The next line in the CEA 2034 Spinorama data is the early reflections line. And this graphic again was also pulled out of Dr. Tool's book and it provides you with an illustration as well. And what you can see here is if you try to, it's, it's kind of hard to get through all this, I understand, but basically what you're getting is the frontal hemisphere of the speaker. So everything firing in the front half of the speaker toward you, along with the rear wall reflections, 180 degrees directly behind the speaker, hits that wall behind the speaker, and then it bounces off and comes to the listener. And at the bottom, I provided you with the definition. This is estimate of all single bounce, first reflections in a typical listening room, zero degrees to plus or minus 90 degrees. So 90 degrees horizontally off axis, and then 180 degrees horizontal, so directly behind the speaker, as well as plus or minus 20 degrees to plus minus 40 degrees in the vertical plane. The next line in the graphic is sound power. Sound power is actually really easy. This is just all the sound that's radiated from the speaker, every single direction, 360 degrees horizontally around the speaker and 360 degrees above and below the speaker. And the definition below, all the sounds arriving at the listening position after any number of reflections from any direction. The next set of graphics that I'm gonna show you are based on directivity index. And before I talk about those, I'm gonna talk about another line that is in the graphic 
and that is the directivity index offset. This is just a zero dB line or represents zero dB. And the purpose of this line would be to show you, hey, if I have a speaker that is perfectly omnidirectional and it's firing the same sound frontward and backwards, up and down, then it would be a flat zero dB directivity index line. That means it's fully omnidirectional. And with this in mind, we're gonna talk about the two different directivity indices. The first of those directivity indices is the early reflections directivity indices. And per the definition at the bottom, this is the difference between the listening window curve and the early reflections curve. We already discussed what the early reflections curve was and we discussed what the listening window curve is and the early reflections directivity index is just the difference between those two curves and the DI values are always shown down at the bottom. So if you're ever looking for directivity, that's always gonna be at the bottom of the graphic. The second of the directivity indices is the sound power directivity index. And it's basically the same thing as the early reflections indices, except it is listening window versus the sound power. And that's what you see down here in the red. And again, the definition, difference between the listening window curve and the sound power curve. On the surface, all of these seem actually pretty straightforward, but next comes the tricky part. I mean, you understand how they are taken. You understand you measure a speaker on axis and off axis, and based on what you're trying to define, then you use a portion of those measurements to define something. So for example, if you wanna define just the direct sound, that is just the zero degree on axis response of the speaker, if you want to define the listening window, that is the plus or minus 10 degrees vertical and the plus or minus 30 degrees horizontal response. This stuff is pretty straightforward to put on a graph. I mean, if you if you had the data, anybody with Excel could, could graph this. You just have to get the data. That's the really tough part. The other tough part is analysis. What are you looking for when you look at this data? The direct sound on axis, as I discussed in the first video, should ideally be flat. Flat, smooth, on axis response. You don't want anything differing from what you're feeding the speakers. So if you're playing a source of music, you want that source of music to come out the exact same way as it went into your speakers. And if the on-axis response is any different, then what you're hearing is certainly gonna be different than what you put in. The other aspect, listening window. Now, this one is generally what a lot of people will look at when they're looking at data. They won't really pay attention so much to the direct sound However, I do. The reason for that is it's kind of considered that most people, when they're setting up their speakers, they may not set the speaker up dead on axis. I mean, it doesn't have to be zero degrees. It could be one, two, three, four, maybe even five degrees off. And that's probably close enough to be considered on axis. But when most people set speakers up, I mean, unless they're using like laser levels and busting out rulers or measuring tape, they're probably going to be a little bit further off axis than the zero degrees. And they may be as much as 10. And depending on your living situation, you may not have a choice. You may have to go 20 or 30 degrees off axis. And that's what the listening window is for. And it's also worth noting that the listening window is often used to help define what the sound is gonna be for people in like a home theater type setup. So if you're listening, not in the sweet spot, but to the side of the sweet spot, then the listening window will help give you a good idea of what that listener is gonna hear when they're sitting off to the side. The traits that you want for the listening window is you want it to follow the on axis response and if it doesn't follow it, usually that means there's an issue with directivity in the crossover region or there's a resonance, which is gonna be a very common theme as you go and look at the other data sets. So with that said, let's now look at the early reflections. The early reflections, what you're looking for here in general is again, the same kind of thing. You want it to follow the trend of the on-axis response. However, as you go further off axis, if you're talking about like a standard speaker with a tweeter on the front, you can expect that you're gonna start losing high frequency content. So there's a little bit of, I won't say subjective, but just a little bit of logic and reasoning that needs to go into something like this. You wouldn't expect to have a flat early reflections response. And actually most people probably wouldn't prefer that because that would mean that the energy that is radiated out into the room is coming back at you even louder than what is coming at you directly from the on axis response. Since this is the front hemisphere, mostly of the speaker, the high frequency droop doesn't really stand out in this particular case, but it really does when you go to the sound power measurement. And that's because the sound power is above and below in front and behind of the speaker. And as you can imagine, if you're standing in front of the speaker, you're gonna hear the highs. If you stand to the side, you're gonna hear maybe some highs. 
But if you stand to the back of the speaker and it's only got a tweeter facing toward the front, you're probably not going to hear much high frequency content at all. And that's what this sound power graphic would represent. There are other things that you want to look for these. And generally speaking, you want kind of a smooth response for each of these. So where this is kind of picking up and moving around, this isn't really ideal. And that indicates again, what I mentioned before about resonances, um, directivity errors between a midwoofer and a tweeter. Generally speaking, when I'm looking at data, what I really care about is the early reflections directivity index, which is what we have in this graphic at the bottom. But what I mentioned about the sound power, you know, and I, I said, you kind of want these lines to be smooth and well controlled. That's, that's always the case. The thing that really comes into play here in regards to, you know, preference is how narrow, how sharp of a slope you have with these kind of lines. So in this case, if you were to draw a line from 200 Hertz to let's say 10 kilohertz, you'd be doing something like this. And any deviation from that line would be maybe a, a point of potential error. Now, this particular speaker is, is really not bad in that regard. I've seen other ones that have, you know, a very high knee right here or a low knee or something like that. And those indicate pretty significant issues. This speaker doesn't indicate anything like that. The slope of the line really comes into play as to what you are looking for, you know, what you want because the steeper the slope, the more directional that speaker is, and the wider the slope or the more shallow the slope, for instance, you know, I mentioned earlier, the directivity index line, which was a zero. If it is flat right through here, then that is omnidirectional. The same thing goes for the early reflections directivity index. If it were flat right through here, it would be an omnidirectional speaker and it wouldn't be beaming at any point. It would just be playing 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz, wide open all the way around the speaker, like a big sphere of sound, which means you've got really two extremes. You can have a speaker that is very, very focused, highly beamed, or you can have a speaker that is omnidirectional and anywhere in between there is really kind of up to you as far as what you like. And it is also based on what your room is like. If you have a, you know, a very reverberant room, you may not want a speaker with a low directivity index number, which is to say, you may not want a speaker with, um, you know, more shallow slope because there is more reflection off the side walls and, you know, off the floor and the ceiling. In that case, you may want a speaker that has a higher directivity index. And that would mean that there's less reflection as you go higher in frequency. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, back to the DI offset line, the zero dB point, this is kind of your reference for directivity index. At any point, if the early reflections directivity index or the sound power directivity index goes below that zero directivity index line, that means that there is more energy radiated toward the back than there is toward the front. And that's typically what you see in low frequencies, especially speakers that have rear port. Because when you have a port playing, it's responsible for the very low frequencies. And then the mid bass drivers, the woofers in the front are responsible for the mid to high mid bass frequencies. And as you go above the zero dB line, like these two are going here, that just means that your sound radiation is being more frontward faced. So you're spreading less energy around all the way and it's becoming more focused, more narrow toward the front. And that's what Spinorama provides you in a nutshell. So now we're going to jump into a couple examples and I'm going to provide you with some, you know, notes about what I measured and, you know, kind of how I'm reading and interpreting the data. The first example I'm going to use is the Kef R3 bookshelf speaker. I'll throw the card up at the top if you want to go check out that review. And in this case, what we see is black represents the on axis sound. Starting at the low frequencies, we can see that there is a pretty steep roll off below about, I don't know, what is that, 30 or 40 hertz or so. And then, you know, going higher up to the 100 hertz region, it kind of climbs up. And then above the 100 hertz region, it's relatively flat pretty much all the way through. I think this deviation is around plus or minus 2 dB. Uh, may have actually be less than that. And this is a pretty good speaker overall. Uh, when I listened to this subjectively, I thought the highs could come down just a little bit. But as far as issues with the crossover region, you know, I didn't really notice anything like that. And I thought this was a pretty good speaker. In fact, it has one of the best sound stages I think I've ever heard, which seems to be a characteristic of the coaxial concentric type drive units uh, that the KEF R3 employs. Remember, as I said, we want the listening window response to be similar to the on-axis response. And we are seeing that for the most part, I mean, 
you expect some deviation because as you start to go off axis, you're going to lose a little bit of SPL. So that's okay. But what we don't want is we don't want any, you know, major dips or peaks, you know, that one has and the other one doesn't or vice versa. And I'm kind of seeing a good overall listening response window. However, right around this three kilohertz region, you can see that the listening window kind of catches up to the on axis response. So that's a hint that there may be something going on there. And, and truthfully, I don't recall where the crossover region is on the speaker. Uh, my gut is telling me, though, that that probably has something to do with it. That said, the listening window still looks really good overall, and it continues to follow the on-axis response quite well uh, until you get out to the really, really high frequencies. And when you see you know, a horn-loaded type speaker, which a concentric driver is because it has a tweeter mounted into the mid-range, and the mid-range is essentially the waveguide. So when you see those kind of designs, when you see horns, waveguides, usually you'll see a dip on axis somewhere that doesn't show up off axis. And that actually is a, it's an okay thing. Now the next step is we're gonna look at the early reflections. So remember this is the sound that is radiated mostly forward with only like one reflection point coming directly from behind the speaker. So if we think about it logically, you know, we again expect to see some loss in SPL as we trend from the front of the speaker to the side of the speaker. and in that case, you know, you're losing SPL from the midwoofer and you've got some kind of peakiness going on right around here that indicates potentially a resonance. And the reason I say that is because it's also in the sound power. And usually when you have a peak that shows up in the early reflections and the sound power, that means that something is radiating omnidirectionally. However, this peak is really low in magnitude. So it's not something that I'm gonna lose any sleep over. We keep going and we'll, again, we're expecting, you know, to have some kind of decrease in the overall amplitude, but what happens right through here? You're decreasing and then you're picking back up. Well, we know that the crossover is somewhere in this ballpark. Again, I don't remember exactly where this crossover is, but recalling from memory, you know, it's, it's gotta be somewhere in the, maybe the two and a half, two kilohertz region, give or take. And what we are seeing in this case is the tweeter has picked back up and is omnidirectional at low frequency. So the early reflections, gets broad again here, because if the speaker were radiating omnidirectionally all the time, then the early reflections line would be pretty much probably completely flat. So overall, you know, we can kind of look at this graphic and say, okay, it's, it's got a small resonance here, uh, a potential, you know, issue in the crossover region, but it's not quite that bad. And then the next step is we go to the sound power, which is right here. The sound power is showing me pretty much the same thing that I saw and learned from the early reflections that you do have a little bit of resonance somewhere in this region, and then a sound power mismatch in the crossover region. So overall, the on-axis and the off-axis response looks good. But what I like to do is I like to look at the directivity indices because that helps me identify things a little bit more clearly. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the early reflections DI down here, which is the blue line. Now, remember, this is the early reflections versus the listening window. So the listening window has already been averaged between 30 degrees to each side and 10 degrees top and bottom. And now you're comparing that to the early reflections. At the lowest frequencies, we see that more of the sound is radiated behind the speaker. And that's typical because this speaker has a rear port. And as you go higher in frequency where the mid bass starts to take over in the front, then the radiation pattern trends more frontward and we're going a pretty smooth line right through here until you get to right around 1.8 kilohertz or so. And what this means is that you're increasing in directivity toward the front of the speaker. And then right here, you bring this dip in and that means you're getting wide in directivity. That again would be the tweeter area. This is a coaxial design again. This is a mid-range and the tweeter. And even though you do see this dip, it could be a lot worse. If we continue on past this line right through here, the early reflections DI actually looks really good in my opinion. If this were dead flat, then that might help things out a little bit. But, you know, based on my hearing, I didn't think it was that bad. So now let's jump into a case where you have some pretty significant issues. This is the Klipsch Heresy 4. Now, Klipsch certainly has a sound that a lot of their constituents love and their customers really appreciate. But when you see the data and you see it graphed, you really understand why Klipsch is, is 
either a love it or hate it type thing. There's really not in any in between, at least in my opinion. So with that said, let's start looking at the on-axis response. The on-axis response on the low frequency um, is down pretty far and you don't pick up until almost about 100 hertz. So between 100 hertz and 70 hertz, you've lost about 5 dB in output. The fall off here is not super, super fast, but it's not shallow either. Now you go through the mid range, you see there's a strong dip of about 4 dB right through the basis of the mid range. And that's gonna mess with the, uh, particularly the female vocals and the mid lower fundamental vocals. Then we pick right back up here. There's some funkiness going on here, a strong dip here. Uh, keep going until you get to 1K and another peak there, another dip on axis around 1.6 kilohertz. And as you can just see basically that the whole on axis response of this Clips Heresy 4 is a wreck. It's just all over the place. Now let's look at the listening window to see if that kind of smooths things out. And if we do that, yeah, the listening window tracks pretty well with the on-axis response, and it even fills in this gap right here. So this leads me to believe that this is some kind of geometry thing. The fact that this is filled in indicates that something is going on on-axis that isn't really occurring off-axis, at least to 30 degrees to the side or plus or minus 10 degrees uh, up and down. Then the next step is to look at the early reflections. And the early reflections track with the on-axis and the listening window pretty well, I would say. Again, you're kind of filling in this little on-axis dip here. The bottom line with this speaker is the data shows me, and I absolutely heard like 100%, this speaker is wrought with all sorts of issues. The data shows you that there are issues in the crossover regions, and there's also resonances, either due from port resonances or standing waves inside the enclosure. And if you dig in a little bit more like I did, you know, you take the speaker apart, you can see that there's no internal bracing, there's little damping going on in there, um, and it's just not a very well-constructed enclosure. And I, for what it's worth, this is a $3,000 speaker, whereas the KEF that we just looked at was $1,800. Now, certainly the Eclipse Heresy 4, you know, it has a 12-inch midwoofer, a mid-range compression driver, and a horn-loaded tweeter. So it will get loud, but in terms of fidelity, it's just not there. And you know, some people will say it sounds live or whatever. Uh, we're not even going to get into that mess today, but I think you can tell my point here is that this speaker has a lot of issues going on with it. And then if we go down toward the bottom and look at the early reflections directivity index, we're seeing kind of the same thing. I know that there's a crossover region between the midwoofer and the horn. I think it's somewhere in the 800 hertz region, give or take. I really can't recall exactly where, but if I recall correctly, you know, then we're seeing a pretty decent trend line going up through that point. But then around here, we've got a pretty significant dip. Let's go back to talking about early reflections. Early reflections have a bunch of different measurements that make up the early reflections. And I've given you the definition down here, and I thought it might be helpful for me to explain to you what the early reflections are made up of. If you go to my website, you'll see that I've got some drop down tabs just to help you kind of get through things a little bit more quickly. And if you forget, like I do, what the early reflections are made up of, you just click that tab and it shows you. These are the different components. Now, these components are also provided to you in this graphic. So let's blow this graphic up, take a look at it, and see what we've got. The total early reflections, which has been represented by the blue line up until this point, now it's green. That's the way the template is, don't get mad at me. Um, the idea here is that you want to kind of follow along and see what jumps outside of the total early reflections so you can understand what makes it up and what might be a detriment to what you hear in the seated position. Now, I'm going to jump back here and look at the different things that make it up. Blow this up a little bit more so we can get the definitions. Floor bounce, average of 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and 40 degrees down. So floor bounce. It's just basically just saying, you know, 30 degrees or up to about 40 degrees pointed down below the speaker is floor bounce. So whatever is bouncing off the floor and then coming at your ear, that's what floor bounce is. And what we are seeing here is there is a pickup of the uh, floor bounce in the 700 to about 1.5 to 1.6 kilohertz region, where it differs a good bit from the total early reflection in green. But then going above that, you know, you're, you're matching pretty similarly still, though you're catching more high frequency. So that's going to you know, mess with the sound a little bit, but 
the fact that it's higher in amplitude or lower in amplitude isn't that big of a concern. What you're really trying to pay attention to is where does it really deviate from the overall trend line of the total early reflection? So if it's kind of following along it, but just shifted in amplitude, that's okay. So floor bounce on this speaker, probably okay. Next thing, ceiling bounce, average of 40, 50, 60 degrees up. So the, the top portion of the speaker that's hitting the ceiling and then coming back down to you, that is dashed red. So dashed red is following the green through here. And then it kind of jumps out at about 700 Hertz or so, but you know, it stays within line uh, pretty well until again, you get to the higher frequencies, but then there's a shift right through here. Uh, what is this? I'm just going to say it's about six kilohertz or so. Now, there's a couple areas then where the ceiling bounce is different from the total early reflection. And in those cases, that may mess with your perception of the tonality of the speaker. The next one is going to be the front wall bounce. So 0, 10, 20, and 30 degrees horizontally. This basically means whatever is coming out in front of the speaker, it's hitting that wall that's behind you. Uh, and it's in front of the speaker and then it's coming back to your ears from behind you. So that is the dashed yellow line. And the dashed yellow line follows closely until around, again, 700 hertz, which indicates something's going on around 700 hertz. Uh, dips down, follows again, and then it just really starts to diverge above about two kilohertz. The indication, at least to me, is something is going on at 700 hertz, and then the high frequency is going to be different as it arrives to your ears versus the overall total early reflection. And it seems that the front wall bounce is probably skewing this average uh, even higher. So it's, it's possible that if you put some absorption behind you that would trap the, what, two kilohertz and above, that may actually help this speaker a good bit. And generally speaking, absorption is kind of a funky thing. I wouldn't use absorption to catch a deep null, but when it's broadband like this, I think absorption behind you might work well or, you know, diffusion, one of those two things. I'm not a huge uh, nerd when it comes to acoustic paneling and things like that, but I think absorption would probably be the way to go there behind you. Now, sidewall bounces, okay? So this is gonna be the sound that comes out from the side of the speakers, hits your sidewalls, and then comes into your ears. And that is this dashed pink, it's, it's more of like a hot pink color. And let's see if we can follow that through. So around 700 hertz, you start to diverge uh, and it follows along the early reflections pretty well, but you, again, you still have some more difference here um, between the total early reflection and the sidewall bounce in terms of amplitude. So it's possible that even doing some light, the maybe absorption there could help. Uh, again, this is kind of anecdotal though, so don't take this to the bank. Rear wall bounces, that's gonna be the sound from directly to the side of the speakers and directly to the back of the speaker, and then coming right back at you off of those walls. And those are usually the ones that are gonna behave a lot more differently than the total early reflection overall makeup. Those are the ones that really skew that total early reflection. And it really just makes sense because again, think about it. This is a speaker with high frequency in the front. It doesn't have a tweeter or a mid range even behind it. So you can expect that as you go around to the back of the speaker, that there's going to be no mid frequency, certainly no high frequency content coming from behind the speaker that would reflect and hit the wall and then come back. And what we see here is that, yes, that is exactly the case. The rear wall bounce data is indicating that there is hardly anything coming off the rear speaker and then coming back into it. So that's really what's kind of skewing the overall total early reflection. And personally speaking, you know, I don't really think this is a big deal. Uh, I think possibly even ideally you would want a speaker that doesn't have any uh, rear wall bounce because then it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't skew the response at all. But that is something that I may have to investigate. This isn't a graphic that I really pay attention to a lot, but it is useful. Uh, usually in my reviews, I kind of have to blow past this one. So hopefully me doing this will allow me more time to talk about some finer points in this data in future reviews. The last thing I'm going to mention is the estimated in-room response, but I'm not going to talk about it in this video because this deserves a video all on its own. So I'm going to say that for the next video, I'm going to wrap this video up. I appreciate you guys watching and I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the comments below. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it and I will talk to y'all later. Peace.